Ladies and gentlemen and friends, after such a rich discussion this morning and such a wonderful opening, I think some of you have certainly think you need a little stretch or a cup of tea, but I do expect that you will come back because I think the expectations created from this morning are going to be sustained by the panelists who have come uh, with the rich experience that they have and talking about what we will be talking about now, which is impunity and the gaps, identifying judicial gaps and dealing with them through targeted advocacy and public engagement. The two very experienced per panelists that I have been privileged to moderate the discussion of are Jose Carlos Ugas, who is the president of Proetica, TI's chapter in Peru. And how the world has changed, you will understand from the fact that Peru brings for me the memory of the Global Anti-Corruption Conference, which was addressed by President Fujimori. And what distinguishes our speaker today is that he acquired respect and prominence in prosecuting the legacy of Fujimori while Fujimori was, had to leave the country and, and seek various forms of asylum elsewhere. He is a distinguished lawyer. He has, under his mandate, assets were frozen abroad and recovered. He was a member of the UN Election Observers Mission for El Salvador and served the World Bank's Institutional Integrity Office. Again, how the world has changed. The World Bank, which thought initially that corruption was something one should not get into because it is interference in the domestic affairs of countries. Now, the Institutional Integrity Office is not only has someone who has served there, but what an inspiring address we had from the Vice President of that Integrity Division of the World Bank, Leonard McCarthy, from South Africa. Uh, we also have, of course, he's a teacher of criminal law, and as a fellow law teacher and law practitioner, I feel very much at home in the company of these panelists. This, our second panelist is Balthazar Garzon Real, a, a Spanish jurist who served on Spain's Central Criminal Court, the Audiencia Nacional, and in that capacity investigated important criminal cases in Spain, including terrorism, organized crime, and money laundering. In 1993-94, he was elected a deputy and served as a minister in the uh, Philippe Gonzalez government, and then returned again to the Audiencia Nacional, where he led a series of investigations that helped convict a government minister as the head of the Grupo Santerrorista de Liberación. And of course, he gained international attention when he issued an international warrant for the arrest of former Chilean president Augusti, Augusto Pinochet for the alleged deaths and torture of Spanish citizens. So we have two very distinguished panelists, and I will ask them first to address you on the topic which was the, been assigned to this panel, no impunity, closing the judicial gaps through targeted advocacy and public engagement. May I ask, Professor, uh, first, who would like to go first? Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, after 20 years of uh, TI's work, I believe there have been great achievements. One of them, of course, is putting the issue of corruption in the agenda and making visible this problem. TI has delivered many tools, chapters are working uh, firmly and strongly on the field, but still there is too much corruption out there. And worst, there's a lot of impunity. Impunity generates frustration and disappointment because despite all the efforts we display, we observe that nothing happens to the corrupt they go away with it. Uh, worse even, many of them are socially admired and have positions and are recognized as distinguished people in society. So 
it's a time when we need to develop some complementary action in order to try to generate consequences for the corrupt. TI's collaborative approach to the matter of corruption needs to be complemented now with some new vision about it. And that's the reason why the movement has developed the 2015 strategy. In our new strategy, we are making a bet in order to engage people, to mobilize, to involve youth, use social media, media, and one of our main pillars that we are working intensively in these months is try to develop a no impunity initiative. So what do we have to say from our experience in TI regarding civil society, justice, and impunity. Many of our chapters and uh, the movement uh, entirely has done a lot of work with justice. We've been working with the Justice Administration for many years. But what happens when the Justice Administration does not comply? The consequence is impunity. Justice is part of the system that is there in order to try to avoid corruption and when it happens to generate these consequences. How the social, the civil society needs to approach the justice system. For many years, we have been cooperating in training programs, building capacity, delivering tools for judges, prosecutors, policemen. But as I said at the beginning, many times we cannot observe a change of attitude or efficiency in the delivery of justice. So I think civil society needs to have a strategic approach to the justice system depending on the environment in which it is operating. And uh, we have detected in our analysis of the No Impunity Initiative that one of the main problems with the justice system is the political interference. When we should have an independent judiciary, we observe frequently that the governments and the executive and the groups in power or economical interests are manipulating the system and impeding a delivery of a neutral and a just decision from the system. So, uh, but the political interferences has not always the same level in all our countries, on all our systems. So I think we need to identify which type of environment regarding political interferences or corruption of the system we are going to operate with. So I think we can divide this in environments with high levels of political interference, environments with medium level of political interference or corruption, and of course systems where justice works works good and there is very little or zero political interferences. For these environments with high levels of political interference or corruption, the space for cooperation from civil society is very little. Of course, if there is a space, we should be there and try to cooperate and generate spaces in order to put the elements of no corruption in the system. But we need to be clear that not always this is possible. Very frequently it is not possible and we should not be naive. And we need to be clear when these cooperation spaces exist or when they do not. And when we find that there is no space, I think the role of civil society needs to be more on the side of monitoring, generating pressure, social pressure as we heard just in the previous panel, mobilize the people, and now we are trying to develop a new strategy on social sanction. Because when justice and the law are not working, the corrupt need to pay some type of consequence, and this type of consequence should be more on the political and social side when, as I say, law does not work. There are several examples of this. Our chapter in Honduras, for example, is doing an extraordinary work 
in the reforms that have been put in place in order to reduce the levels of social insecurity. And the justice system plays a tremendous role there. Our chapter tried really hard to cooperate with our reforms until they knew and understood that it was not possible and they withdraw. Now the role of our chapter is a role of generating social pressure, working with the media, appointing where the problems of lack of political will for the reforms exist and what is going on regarding corruption in the justice system. In Guatemala, where impunity was a real gross uh, reality, civil society put pressure on the foreign governments that were cooperating with the Guatemalan government and they generated a unique experiment that has worked quite well. It's a type of international prosecutorial office, the CICIC, who has been successful in pursuing crimes that in the past remained impune. In Afghanistan, Integrity Watch Afghanistan has been monitoring the reforms and the efforts in order to try in such a difficult environment to deliver justice from the system. So in all these cases and many others of our chapters working on the field, we find that when the space to cooperate with a system doesn't exist or is very reduced, the response must be more on the side of social pressure, monitoring, uh, mobilizing people. In the yellow zone, when the political interference is of a medium level and there's some space, of course, we should cooperate. And many of our chapters also do that in countries where this yellow zone exists. My own country, Peru, we have the TI chapter sitting on the commission that has been established in order to develop anti-corruption policies. But sometimes the environment changes very easily, so Social, uh, civil society and our groups must be aware in order to identify when the political will disappears or is lacking to take distance and probably return to the first strategy more on the side of mobilizing, generating pressure and so on. And of course, in countries with very low political interferences or where corruption is not a problem with justice, our role as civil society is to, al to alert to be allies of the system and try to cooperate with the justice administration as much as possible. Summarizing, I think that the role of civil society regarding justice in a corrupt environment and in order to avoid impunity has to be, when possible, as a cooperation group of the justice administration, but when the political will is lacking, then our role is more on the side of our new strategy trying to generate spaces for no impunity, mobilizing people, engaging youth, and uh, generating some other tactics. Uh, a strategic litigation, for example, is something we should try in order to challenge that system and try to obtain some responses when the systems are not working. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing those insights, and I'm sure that when we have our discussion, you will see how this is matched by similar experiences uh, in, in so, so many other countries, including Asia, because we've heard about Latin America now. I hope we'll hear from you about your experiences based in Spain. Balthazar Real. Sí. Buenos días. Y Enhorabuena a Transparencia Internacional por estos 20 años de ya mayoría de edad. Me encanta la, la visión tan optimista de mi buen amigo José Ugaz. La mía no es tan optimista desde el punto de vista de la justicia, claro. Él habló desde el punto de vista de la sociedad civil. Y ahí estamos de acuerdo. Desafortunadamente, ese impulso, ese compromiso, esa labor de denuncia de organizaciones de la sociedad civil es cierto. También es cierto 
que en los últimos años, especialmente en Europa, especialmente en mi país, el nivel de tolerancia frente a la corrupción se ha reducido. Hace 20 años, cuando Transparencia Internacional nacía, la regla general en muchos países era que no daba miedo ser corrupto. Incluso se eh, ponía de manifiesto la admiración a aquellos que lo eran y lo que se discutía era si eran demasiado torpes para que les sorprendieran, pero no el hecho en sí del comportamiento. Después de cada escándalo de corrupción en cada país, viene un torrente de normas y medidas para luchar contra la corrupción. Ocurrió en los años 90, en los 2000, ahora. La cuestión es si realmente hay una convicción por parte de los poderes públicos, más allá de la que se plasma en una norma, de luchar contra la corrupción y sus manifestaciones. El 30 de octubre de este año, es decir, hace ocho días, eh, se ha debatido, o se sometió una semana antes, se sometió por el Parlamento Europeo para la Comisión la Comisión de Crimen Organizado, Lavado de Activos y Corrupción, 127 medidas para combatir la corrupción. Por la importancia de este documento y del documento que eh, fechas anteriores había producido el GAFI en, y el G20 en París, es que por primera vez ya se relacionaban los tres fenómenos. No crean que ha sido fácil. Cuando la corrupción es el soporte de la impunidad y es evidente que aunque, se decía antes, aparece como una manifestación local, pero sin duda con efectos universales, hoy día es más que evidente que está presente en todo este tipo de fenómenos criminales, transversalizándolos y constituyéndose en el instrumento ideal del crimen organizado por cuanto establece espacios de impunidad, facilita la penetración de las instituciones y, consecuentemente, dificulta la persecución. Y ahí es donde el Poder Judicial de cualquier país, de todos los países, en unos con mayor o menor intensidad, no está adecuadamente diseñado para hacer frente a este fenómeno. Paste simplemente para demostrar lo que digo, el tiempo, y es un esfuerzo que le pediría a todos y a todas los que están aquí hoy, ¿Cuánto tiempo tarda un proceso judicial de corrupción en el país respectivo en concluir desde que se inicia la investigación hasta que se obtiene una sentencia definitiva? Si quieren, podemos complicar más. Le introducimos el elemento de lavado de activos. Le introducimos el tema de los paraísos fiscales, que en forma permanente y constante van aliados a cualesquiera de las transferencias a través de las cuales se mueve el dinero. Parece, según los informes más juiciosos, que al menos el 50% de las transferencias mundiales pasan 
en algún momento por un paraíso fiscal o territorio offshore. Si estamos hablando de transparencia, si estamos hablando de solidaridad, de confianza, de aproximación de los diferentes sistemas, la pregunta es de qué sirven los paraísos fiscales cuando parece ser que su único objetivo es precisamente incidir negativamente en esa transparencia y en ese principio de igualdad que debería de haber en todos los países. Porque al final lo que sucede es que quienes no utilizan estos mecanismos salen perjudicados como aquellos que no utilizan prácticas corruptas. El Poder Judicial a la hora de investigar este tipo de crímenes, se encuentra con la imposibilidad de acceder a la información. No hay mecanismos operativos de información dentro de las investigaciones judiciales. Es cierto que se ha avanzado mucho en el ámbito de la inteligencia financiera, de la cooperación o coordinación de investigaciones fiscales o policiales, pero todavía muy poco en el ámbito judicial, a pesar de que desde hace más de 20 años los esfuerzos, al menos en la Unión Europea, se vienen produciendo. Pero para que un poder judicial pueda desarrollar esas investigaciones, tiene que ser un poder judicial debidamente protegido, debidamente defendido, y no solo con una independencia judicial hacia afuera, sino hacia adentro. Muchas veces es el propio sistema judicial y es el propio sistema piramidal el que establece ese defecto de independencia por cuanto el organismo superior no solo extiende su competencia a mantener o revocar la decisión del inferior, sino a veces hacerle objeto de investigación por interpretación de las normas. A eso añadamos la defectuosa configuración todavía de los delitos relacionados con la corrupción. Todavía no hay lo que sería en muchos países una asociación ilícita para cometer, para desarrollar actos de corrupción. La configuración a sí mismo de la corrupción como delito autónomo, al margen o además de las propias manifestaciones como sobornos, cohechos, tráfico de influencias, etc., la, el diseño de una figura compleja de crimen organizado, lavado de activos y corrupción. La consideración de crimen internacional y, por tanto, amparado bajo el principio de jurisdicción universal, es decir, perseguible en cualquier parte del mundo y por cualquier juez que tenga esa competencia. Esos son principios que realmente demostrarían que hay una verdadera voluntad de investigar desde el aparato judicial la corrupción. Pero además es que el compromiso de la sociedad civil tiene que hacerse, y con esto voy a ir terminando, más evidente mediante, por ejemplo, la creación de comités de apoyo a las investigaciones anticorrupción. Los ciudadanos tienen que participar, no pueden ser ajenos. La cuestión de la investigación y de la persecución de la corrupción es una obligación de todos. Y definir qué es lo interesante, lo importante para los ciudadanos mediante la participación activa a través de esos comités de apoyo para la investigación de la corrupción administrativa sin perjuicio de las responsabilidades de los jueces. 
Es decir, hay que producir un cambio de paradigma sobre el tratamiento jurídico penal de la corrupción y la forma de afrontar el fenómeno de la corrupción desde el área de la educación, la formulación de nuevas políticas sociales y de nuevos compromisos ciudadanos. Si cada vez actuamos o seguimos actuando en forma parcial en cada uno de estos ámbitos, nunca vamos a tener una visión completa del fenómeno. Y siempre habrá una forma nueva para eludir aquellas otras que ya estamos definiendo y que no les quepa la menor duda de que ya están amortizadas. Les cuento una anécdota para que vean la contradicción que a veces se produce en la investigación del crimen organizado. En mi país, al principio de los años 90, las organizaciones de narcotraficantes estaban perfectamente delimitadas. Aquellas que traficaban con hachís, las que traficaban con heroína, las que traficaban con cocaína, las organizaciones del este de Europa, las del de sur de Europa, las sudamericanas, es decir, cada uno tenía su papel. Nosotros iniciamos una investigación contra todos los grandes capos del narcotráfico en la zona norte de España, en Galicia. Y fue importante, se consiguió su detención y después otras operaciones más frente a las estructuras de cada una de ellas. ¿Y saben lo que ocurrió? Esa capacidad de transformación y de fagotización que tiene el crimen organizado, que lo que conseguimos con el ingreso en las prisiones es que pudieron conocerse unos a otros y se generaron organizaciones más complejas en las que el elemento personal pasaba a segundo plano y el negocio y el sistema era lo que primaba, con lo cual se nos hizo más difícil la persecución. Es decir, por eso digo que las medidas tienen que ser mucho más complejas que las estrictamente judiciales, policiales y de persecución. Son son absolutamente necesarias, claro, pero tiene que haber ese plus más de compromiso de la sociedad civil de participar, de definir y de inspeccionar en forma directa el ejercicio de esta actividad. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have got from both the panelists what all of us would expect, which is the benefit of rich insights gained from their actual experience. To say that it's not the letter of the law or just the formal existence of institutions, but how they work and how they are drawn upon by those who, like all of us in TI, are determined to say no to corruption. If you have that determination, that is the starting point, and then you try to find within the institutions and within the law, those resources which you can draw upon to deal with those who are the powerful, those who are I call the coalition of the corrupt is much more powerful than our coalition who are combating them in terms of resources, but not in terms of our strength to combat them despite that deficiency. Now, I, I would like to take one minute to also say how since people have recounted the history, how Peter Eigen, who is also a lawyer, although in his CV he doesn't mention that too much, but he is a distinguished lawyer, and we hear about his World Bank role in, in, in Africa, but it was with that same conscientious lawyer's uh, mind that he perceived what he was seeing there, that so much of the assistance going to Africa is not reaching the people. A very substantial proportion of that third or more, was siphoned off. That is how I was introduced to him as a person who was concerned on the basis of his direct experience in Africa and what he saw within the, from within the World Bank. Why he got found a very sympathetic ear with me is that I had just come to the UN on a three-month assignment to work on the Earth Summit preparations. 
for the Rio summit. And the Secretary General somehow thought, who would be a good person for Peter Eigen to speak to within the UN system? It was my good fortune, and I believe in providence, because it was completely providential. It was not within the terms of my assignment or the terms of the work I was doing on the Earth Summit. But this is, here is an, a person who's got interesting experience from Africa, would like to speak and see what the UN system can, how it can respond to it. So I had the privilege of receiving Peter. And hearing him, I was moved because I had come from a country where we had just removed a general who had come in through a coup and who had acquired a reputation in eight years of being the richest president of the poorest country in the world. And this is what was my motivation for listening to Peter. And when he was saying, you have, we, we have to do something about it, I said, you can't be, you're preaching to someone totally converted. We have to do something. And it was that initiative through which we got people from within the UN system, people around New York, professionals, as you have said rightly, that lawyers have to draw upon others, professionals, forensic accountants, people who have investigating capacity, people from the financial world, all of whom could come and share their, their insights into, yes, something can be done. And that's where the idea of a coalition was born, that yes, it, lawyers may be at the core, but it's something which requires much wider um, uh, network and therefore a coalition. And so the coalition of the for anti-corruption, the concept emerged out of that. And I just would make two more comments of specific cases where how international cooperation has made a difference. Because I think you, you, uh, you made the point that within the country, yes, but universal jurisdiction, you have to reach out and get others' involvement, particularly on money laundering. Now, there are two cases, and particularly I say that we've had distinguished speakers from South Africa, and our own uh, CEO is from South Africa. Now, that is one country that I, I would like to refer to, and the other is Canada, where, which who, from where our, our own uh, president comes. I was involved in a case where a contract for petroleum exploration was made in my country by a company which was ostensibly Canadian. They had a Canadian name. The person who came, we found out, was really basically a fortune hunter. He used that name to get the license and then was trying to sell it around the world. And no exploration had taken place for two or three years. He then forged a document to get an extension. Fortunately, that enabled us to seize his papers, from which it was found that he was sending almost um, by that time, two or three million dollars to his private account in New York. But he was a very bold person. We saw that the, his contract was cancelled, but he then started an international arbitration in the World Bank Center for S Settlement of Investment Disputes, ICSID. And in that ICSID case, I took the brief for our government and said, the Canadian lawyers came, and he had used the Canadians to say this was Canadian foreign investment which was being uh, 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 wrongfully uh, taken away. So I stood up in the beginning and I said, yes, we very much respect the Canadian company who is aggrieved, but do you know that you, the person who represented you has been siphoning off two, three million dollars into his private account in New York? So the Canadian council said, what is it to you, Bangladesh? It is our money. So I said, no, it's not right, because the structure of the contract is all the money that is spent will have to be recompensed through oil or gas, which is discovered. So I said, this $3 million that has gone to New York, $3 million worth of oil or gas will have to go from Bangladesh with interest. So he paused, and I said, please go back to your board in Canada and tell them this, because Canadians don't do this kind of thing. This is our conviction about Canada. So I said, please, you go back, tell your board that would they stand behind this person who has used your name and is now trying to lead you in, into a claim against Bangladesh? They said, all right, we'll adjourn the hearing, we'll come back and tell you. And it will be some consolation to all of us to say when they came back, they stood up and said, yes, our board has considered this matter, they are withdrawing this case. So we got emboldened, a former Chief Justice was with me and our team, he said, why don't you ask for costs? So I said, well, we've actually, this is a $100 million claim which has been withdrawn. 
said, no, no, why didn't we purchase for the record, ask for cost. We asked for costs and got $90,000 in costs. So this is how the system which they had thought they would use to harass us was turned against them. Not only was this case withdrawn, but with costs. The second case, and this is because also I wish Mr. M uh, Vice President McCarthy was here, because Lavalin was mentioned. And Lavalin brings Bangladesh, the World Bank, a number of other countries, Tunisia, uh, and day before yesterday, passing through India and the Indian papers, the name Lavalin is there as being under investigation. So this again is a Canadian company which has been a disgrace to Canada because I believe with the Montreal airport they have some, some sort of wrongdoing by they're being prosecuted. From Tunisia their wrongdoing led to the removal of their CEO and in Bangladesh now this is where it comes in. We had a huge project for building one of the longest bridges around one of our largest rivers and suddenly the World Bank informed us that we find there is wrongdoing. The consultants who have been appointed, they have been changed twice. The first consultant was not accepted. Another committee was made, that was not accepted. A third one has come in, who lo and behold is Lavalin. But we find there are certain questions that arise and irregularities for which you need to investigate. And I must say again, I remember, I, I, to, our, to our credit, Ocampo, who was also originally involved with TI and was then the chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, came as part of the team, along with someone from Mr. McCarthy's office, and told us that, look, we have found all these irregularities. We've come to help your government to clean up this, their act so that we can go ahead with the loan. Unfortunately, ill-advised as our government was, they said, no, no, it's the World Bank which is corrupt. Let them produce the documents. So then the documents came. And now there is a prosecution underway in Canada in the Canadian courts. This is about international cooperation, universal jurisdiction. You see, it was corruption in, in Bangladesh. But the prosecution, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police have visited us. They have shown, uh, brought the documents. Two, three of the officials of Lavalin are accused. And this is where I say with some sorrow that the people they have identified in Bangladesh our Anti-Corruption Commission has identified them, and some of their names have been sent for prosecution in Bangladesh, but not the people at the highest level. Right up to the permanent secretary of the ministry has been indicted, but not the one above. And as you can imagine, what the secretary will say, can a secretary do something without approval from up above in a multi-million dollar contract? So this is why I'm saying, thanks to Canada, thanks to you know, other countries who are willing to cooperate, and who will not give protection to corruption in another country. And this is, underlines exactly what both of you have been saying, that universal jurisdiction, international cooperation is critical. And that is why TI is making, making that possible. And look at how the international organizations are coming on board. What uh, Mr. Pascal Lamy had to say, what uh, the other distinguished panelists had to say about political corruption. And that, again, ties up with what you just spoke of that what is undermining judicial institution, the big gap, is formally our constitution say independence of the judiciary. Judiciary will decide everything freely, fairly, and without influence. But it's political influence, and where I would say, just as we say that lawyers have had a negative view, people have a negative view of some lawyers, but I say, no, there are conscientious lawyers, like Peter Eigen, conscientious lawyers like Ugo uh, uh, Ulas and our, our professor here, and so many others, and in South Africa. I remember this uh, Albi Sachs, who's the writer of their constitution, who lost his arm fighting for apartheid. And my, and, but at the moment, I would like to open the floor for questions. But to say that what you have said is enormously valuable, that you need to be innovative, strategic, how you use law, how you use the courts, how you use international courts, how you use money laundering legislation, all of these you need to strategize with in specific cases. And as I say, in my own experience, I found this has worked and is working. And of course, it's a very difficult and uphill task, but nonetheless, we have achieved results. You have achieved remarkable results. And of course, I mentioned, Eva Jolie was mentioned. So I think you would all legitimately be bracketed with Eva Jolie as someone who has used the law 
as a fighter for corruption and has won one of our TI Integrity Awards. I remember in Budapest we honored her. Was it Budapest? Prague, Prague, Prague. Sorry, it was in Prague that we honored her. That's right. Well, now let's, can I open the, the floor to questions? Yes, and please. My name is Jitendra Kohli from India. Impunity is not just a function of manipulation of the judicial system. Absolutely. There are preceding steps. First, the complaint must be registered against the politician or the official. Then an investing, investigating agency has to investigate. And there is a prosecution. Sure. Unless steps are taken at each stage, the final result will be failure or impunity. Okay. Now, the morning session also brought out a very important thing which precedes this, and that is a sophisticated form of manipulation. You know, a question was asked, and uh, the former Prime Minister of Belgium very candidly said, these banking products, I don't understand. I was really amazed by his honesty, because from transparency point of view, they said the figures are there. But most common people who are not financial wizards will fail to understand the products. Uh, I was actually reminded of the story of the emperor and new clothes, where one child from the crowd said, I don't see any clothes on him. So he said, I don't understand these products, although he was a former prime minister, which was absolutely amazing. Now, some statements were also made in the morning that when multinationals, who some of whom may even be supporting this movement, said that, okay, we'll be honest in Germany, but if I have to work in India or other developing countries, you know, those are the established practices or best practices. Is this not another camouflage for corruption? So now the question is as follows. TI movement has come thus far with some tangible instruments, one such instrument being the Integrity Pact. Obviously, when we are talking of impunity today, which means some of these instruments have failed to check corruption, obviously. So we need instruments. We need new instruments. If impunity is going to be the strategic initiative of TI in the next 20 years, what are those tangible instruments? Because ultimately, emotion, the abstract, has to be converted into tangible steps. Only then we shall have efficiency. So my question is, what are those tangible instruments? to check corruption at the, or manipulation which results in impunity at the judicial phase, at the prosecution phase, at the investigation phase, and at the registering of the complaint phase, and more importantly, the game which multinationals play. Don't get discovered. You don't even come into those four steps. Thank you. Thank you. May I ask Mr. Ugas? Well, a task force is working currently in trying to First of all, understand as much as possible the problem of impunity and then create some tools and put some ideas on the table for our chapters also to make the inputs. Uh, regarding judiciary in particular, we are at this moment, we have had some meetings, one in Romania. Uh, our chapter in Romania is very active and has a lot of experience working with the judiciary. And for example, we are thinking of establishing a barometer in order to measure the levels of political interferences in each of our countries. Mm -hmm. And according to the results of that, then develop a strategy uh, depending on the context where we have to work. Uh, a scorecard is also being in, in, in work and we have several products that will be delivered in the following months regarding campaigns Probably one of the most innovative tools we are uh, thinking to, to develop is social sanctioning. So we are exploring other experiences around the world on social sanctioning. Uh, because we believe that from civil society when uh, people express and organize themselves and in these days uh, all that technical means, social media, generate real uh, possibilities in order to uh, put pressure when some correction actions need to be made. Thank you. Would you like to add to that? 
Bueno, yo creo que primero en el ámbito del Poder Judicial habría que cambiar las mentes ¿no? y generar, generar la convicción dentro del Poder Judicial de que es posible combatir la corrupción. Para eso los jueces, que hay ejemplos de heroísmo, pero normalmente son personas normales y corrientes, que tienen sus miedos y sus afectos y sus dudas, necesitan una seguridad a la hora de impartir justicia como los fiscales a la hora de procurar justicia. Eso implica un espacio de, de protección de la independencia real. No solo externa, como decía antes, no solo del de ámbito político, del ámbito mediático, que es un tema que no hemos tratado y lo mismo que tiene gran importancia para la lucha contra la corrupción, tiene gran importancia también como vehículo de corrupción por los intereses corporativos que se mueven, como de eh, el poder económico. Si conjuntamos los tres, vemos que son los enemigos más claros en una investigación judicial. Pero dentro del Poder Judicial, en función del sistema de designación y de promoción de los jueces y de acceso a la carrera judicial y en función de la designación del gobierno de los jueces, va a haber un espacio que puede convertirse en un verdadero espacio de defensa y apoyo o en todo lo contrario. En muchos países la designación del gobierno de los jueces es de designación política o por cuotas políticas. Yo vengo defendiendo que el gobierno de los jueces tiene que ser designado por el pueblo. Si el pueblo es el titular de la justicia, también debería ser el que eligiera al gobierno de los jueces, no a los jueces, sino al gobierno de los jueces. Para que un poder judicial pueda combatir la corrupción, tiene que ser, estar limpio de corrupción. Sin embargo, el poder judicial, el sistema judicial, en muchos países es de los más corruptos, o al menos de los que menos credibilidad ofrecen a los ciudadanos. La cuota está del 70% de desconfianza hacia arriba. Eso es muy grave, porque difícilmente el Poder Judicial va a afrontar ese combate si la sociedad civil no cree en lo que está haciendo. Por tanto, un sistema de transparencia interno dentro del de sistema judicial, de rendición de cuentas, de gestión externa, Sería básico. Obviamente hay que contar con los mecanismos adecuados. La mayoría de las operaciones a través de las cuales se produce hoy día la corrupción ya no es tanto la entrega de una coima o de una mordida de mano a mano que se sigue haciendo, sino también a través de mecanismos de ingeniería financiera de tráfico de influencias, de una serie de posiciones que pueden convertirse en cientos o decenas de millones de dólares. Por tanto, si al Poder Judicial y a los fiscales no se les dota de una preparación científica, además de esa independencia, además de esa protección externa y de unos conjuntos de investigación formados expertos, es evidente que no vamos a conseguir porque no se comprende el fenómeno, porque cuando llegue la investigación judicial ya pasó cinco veces la misma operación 
y cinco veces vamos por detrás. Por tanto, esos son mecanismos que tienen que darse. Pero es que estos mismos mecanismos venimos demandándolos desde hace más de 20 años. Y por fin ahora, como decía antes, se dan cuenta las instituciones europeas de que faltaban. Yo recuerdo en 1994, en una primera reunión que tuvimos jueces y fiscales eh, que investigábamos casos de corrupción, crimen organizado, lavado de activos en Ginebra, que pusimos las bases para una cooperación judicial cuando no existía esa cooperación judicial. Después, dos años después, hicimos lo que se llamó la Pelle de Genève. La Pelle de Genève en 1996 fue idea de un periodista que nos reunió a siete jueces y fiscales y pusimos en común esfuerzos, investigaciones y denuncias. Y recién ahí conseguimos que se movilizara la burocracia europea ante la evidencia que pusimos frente a la sociedad de que no estaban haciendo nada. Eran los tiempos importantes de las investigaciones de de Bajolí, de Ruinbeck, de en España Berlusconi, en Italia contra Berlusconi, Bernan Bertosa, la cooperación, primeras cooperaciones de Suiza para la investigación de la corrupción en España y en todos los demás países europeos. Y fue un momento importante, pero después volvieron otra vez a ponerse las mismas trabas. Y finalmente de todos los elementos, la protección también física de aquellos que colaboran en este tipo de investigaciones, empezando por el juez o por el fiscal. Ya saben ustedes, si se investiga a mafia y crimen organizado, pueden matar al juez o al fiscal o al testigo. Si se investiga corrupción, se le desacredita, se le desprestigia, se le anula, ¿no? El ejemplo lo tenemos Mani Pulite, tenemos y los jueces de Palermo, Antimafia, por ejemplo. Pero es que apelamos en todas las normativas a la colaboración de testigos, de personas, y sin embargo, después no hay mecanismos de protección algunos. Y podía enumerarle, no uno, varios casos donde finalmente la persona o personas se quedan solas pierden todo, incluso la vida. Entonces, hay una falta de conciencia y una falta de compromiso real por parte de los diferentes estados en ese tipo de prácticas. Y ahí es donde la presión de la sociedad civil, esa participación proactiva que obligue también, no a la acción reactiva de los jueces, sino proactiva, esté presente. Si no es así, de nuevo, la euforia de la lucha contra la corrupción pasará y dentro de unos años volveremos otra vez al punto en el que nadie le preocupa este tema de la corrupción. En España hace cinco años la corrupción estaba en el penúltimo lugar de interés de los ciudadanos. Ahora está prácticamente el segundo o el primer lugar de interés. ¿Por qué? porque hay unos escándalos de corrupción que han estallado por los cuatro costados y han demostrado que en España había un mal de fondo y era que no se había abordado en profundidad el problema de la corrupción política y de la corrupción privada y pública y la alianza de las dos con un impacto político. Entonces, ahora nos estamos dando cuenta... ¿Y saben cuánto tiempo lleva el caso principal de corrupción que afecta al hoy Partido Popular que gobierna España? Pues arrancó en el año 2001, y lo arranqué yo, y todavía estamos en 2013 y no hay visos de que se pueda celebrar un juicio. Eso al final se convierte desgraciadamente en una impunidad clamorosa en la que todos de una forma o de otra contribuimos a que se produzca. Y ese es, es el cáncer. ¿no? Thank you very much.
Thank you both very much for very comprehensive answers, and the question was also such that enabled you to make this comprehensive answer. I'm afraid we have run out of time, and of course you can all continue uh, over lunch and, and beyond, but I'll just, uh, I also follow the very inspired example of the previous moderator, not uh, even attempting a summing up, but to just mention two or three points. One is that in taking on the powerful corrupt. Now, we had this general who la lasted for eight years, and he started off by arresting all the leaders of the lawyers, all the presidents of the Bar Association, 13 of them. So, of course, the first reaction was all the lawyers decided that they would not, they'd abstain from court until all of them were released. This was absolutely total, that all the lawyers spontaneously walked out of the courts and said, unless the 13 come back with unconditionally, within two weeks, no courts will function. It worked. And that gave you a, exactly the idea of the strength you have. So in the movement that, the, oh, then he, he reacted by fragmenting the Supreme Court. He said, we must take justice to the doorsteps. So the Supreme Court is broken up into seven small courts of three judges in remote areas, uh, sitting with no, no con conditions in which a, high, uh, a, a superior court can work. So then there was the lawyers movement, united movement, 67 bar associations got together, had a coordinating committee. 250 lawyers were in prison for different periods of time. Bar leaders were in prison several times. But the end result was we got a judgment from our own Supreme Court saying that this fragmentation was against the Constitution. And I tell you the day this judgment was delivered, and the person who was the Chief Justice actually was in Villa Borsig with us. When it was given, that day the court was full of people from all over, vice chancellors, business leaders, trade union leaders, and when the judgment was pronounced, there was spontaneous applause, and the Chief Justice said, don't forget this is a court, silence. But that was the spontaneous people's reaction, and that movement then carried on as a movement to remove this president. And I tell you, the coordination of the social mobilization, the lawyers could take the initiative because they had been at the targets. So the Bar Association, I was the president of the Supreme Court Bar. We had 24 professional organizations, law, teachers, uh, doctors, engineers, school teachers, journalists, 24 professional associations would meet every month and take common decisions to say, that this president's actions cannot be accepted. Something has to be done. He should not only be removed, but he should be dealt with by law. Now, what became impossible for the president was you know, to find all these associations to be people he could arrest. He, there was intimidation. The president of the Journalist Association was arrested. The journalist's reaction was so strong that, again, they had to release him. So this ultimately is what forced the united movement of the professionals, and then the young people, all the United Students Movement came and joined us and said, now since you are working for unity against an authoritarian setup, we are with you. And that was the day, I tell you, in the last anecdote I finish with, they then had an order, shoot at sight. Anyone now who demonstrates against this president, shoot at sight. So I remember in the Supreme Court bar, I said, no, look, I don't ask any of our members to defy this order but I personally am going to walk out and let us see what they do. And I can tell you that has been the most moving day in my life. When I went out, I looked back, I saw the entire profession behind me. Aged lawyers who couldn't walk, you know, got up on these rickshaws and started to follow. When we came out, the police officer said, sir, sir, what are all of you doing? So I said, you have never seen so many miscreants in your life. You want to shoot, go ahead and shoot. So he quickly got instructions and said, no, all right, you can go a few hundred yards and then disperse. We only had to walk a few hundred yards. All the ministries were on the street. The foreign ministry emptied out. The secretariat in which all the other ministries were there all emptied out, and this president had to go. Not only that, the attorney general of the day prosecuted him, who had been threatened with, you know, to death and so on. He prosecuted him. We convicted him. He was served five years in jail. So th this is the, there are some <laughs> consolations. And I, I salute you both. And I believe the legal profession can be proud of members like you. 
and you know lawyers have had a negative impression just like politicians now have a negative impression oh lawyers are only interested in making money i was in india when a young woman lawyer stood up and said oh you lawyers are all out for making money so i immediately stood up and said no you're making a mistake there are conscientious lawyers all over and i talked to lb sax in south africa and i said he his arm was blown off because he fought against apartheid and the last point i want to make on the note of 20th anniversary why it's been a very moving experience for me to be here to be able to and to participate this morning and i thank uh, frank for the way in which he demonstrated visibly being a communications expert how all of us are in this all of us in the hall all of us outside all of us in all of the 194 countries in the world all are part of this all those who say no to corruption and there are many more people saying no to corruption weak powerless but they're saying no to corruption the powerful few are the ones we have to deal with and we had this wise words from our earlier panelists about the political influence about political uh, the use of money in politics these are themes which i hope in the next two days will enter our discussions and with all and and we have such powerful resources now including president wiseacker in the few minutes i had to talk to him he talked about public financing of elections which was echoed also from among our panelists so you know we now this is what we didn't have 20 years ago in villa borsi we didn't have all of these experienced people like Mr. pascal lamy and the former prime minister of belgium and the former president of this and and all the others who are now we know available to us within reach peter has to ring up on the phone or who get has to ring up on the phone and they are available so look at how enriched we are in terms of experience in terms of knowledge and of course i'm sorry i'm i'm not getting the benefit any twitter twitter responses the bloggers and twitterers i have to be content with you know following up later but thank you all very very much for for this session i personally would like to say that this has been very valuable for us thank you very much